Hello, everyone. I'd like to play devil's advocate here. Now, uh, although I disagree, uh, currently at least, that, that a anarcho-capitalist society or a setup or a civilization is feasible for the human species. I, as promised, I was going to make a video detailing some of the advancements that could occur that could possibly, potentially, lead up to an anarcho-capitalist state or at the very least create an environment that's conducive to it. The question, of course, uh, that we should be exploring is whether or not human beings have an affinity at all for this kind of setup. And uh, it's a question that I think is worth exploring because absolutely it would be a great thing to get rid of the state, to not have to depend on the state, to have a civilization uh, set up so that we, we didn't have to depend on, on a nation state dictating to us what we can and can't do. Uh, taxation, of course, is a big problem. I think it's necessary, but it's, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, because it is the redistribution of wealth. I think that as of right now, we can't set up our uh, society and civilization without that redistribution of wealth. But let's explore then what uh, what is the possibility? How can we start moving away from this dependency on the state? How can we start setting up systems that are, of course, voluntary, uh, that, that do not require uh, the state pointing a gun at you and saying, give me money? There's an interesting channel on YouTube uh, I think the name of the channel is uh, Motherboard, and it's very similar to Vice. It's kind of like these short documentary clips that take a foray, if you will, into some part of the world that people in the West, specifically here in America, are, are a lot less likely to venture into. Places like Afghanistan, Cuba, war zones and the like. And so they give you these 20, 30 minute clips that kind of delve into the life of somebody living in, in, in one of these places so that you can kind of experience life through their eyes without actually having to take the risk of going there. But an interesting video that they made on Cuba specifically was talking about how the embargo, uh, the embargo that the United States imposed on Cuba created a culture because of the mass exodus of, of U.S. engineers and technology and talent and goods and services from Cuba. Uh, this created a culture of kind of DIY enthusiasts, people that had to work with the outdated technologies that they had and, 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 and make do and create working innovations that allowed them to at least have some sort of semblance of keeping up with the Western explosion of technology that was going on all around them. Now, of course, they didn't keep up, right? The people in Cuba didn't keep up, but there was an interesting DIY culture uh, fueling a kind of makeshift hodgepodge deluge of innovation that allowed them to lead a somewhat normal life. Uh, the embargo didn't stop these people from needing washing machines, right? So they had to figure out how to how to not only maintain washing machines, but to but take the parts that were unnecessary out of washing machines and use them in other life hacks. So I think these are very interesting areas that we should be exploring. Uh, places where artificial conditions, or even natural conditions, but uh, specifically artificial scarcity and artificial conditions, like for example, an embargo placed on the Cuban citizenry, created a situation where people had to stop looking towards the government and innovate themselves out of uh, what could have been an unbearable standard of living. Uh, we have to pay attention to people that innovate themselves out of poverty. And, and with that said, there's also an interesting article uh, on CNN talking about the rise of the tent city uh, or the re-rise, I guess, of the tent city in America. This is tragic, of course, and you know we have to change this. Uh, homelessness has to be addressed in general, I think. Uh, before this country can progress but this these communities springing up in the united states are full of people that constitute populations that are ripe for creating the conditions that function as breeding grounds for what an anarcho-capitalist state could or would possibly look like the interesting thing that they mention in this article is that some of these tent cities some of these tent communities have high level of variation in how they organize their society. Some of them resemble uh, the government set up, the nation state set up with rigid rules and you know taxation and their own currency and, and all of that and their own defense forces. And uh, I wish I really wish we could get in contact with some of these people and interview them and see how their their systems of government are being put into place because uh, this is this is a population that really is insulated from the wider federal government. And of course, this isn't a, a pure anarcho-capitalist setup or the breeding ground for it because it's taking place within 
a, a, a nation state, of course, the nation state of, of the United States of America, but it's certainly as close as we're going to get. So we need to start looking at these, these, these tent cities that perhaps have a free for all, uh, anarcho-capitalist setup where there's no rules where people just kind of do whatever it is they want. So long as they don't interfere with everybody else's ability to do the same. And we need to see how their systems of economy, how their systems of commerce, uh, how their systems of barter and trade, if they have them have progressed in the, uh, more rigid societies and how uh, they've progressed in the more free for all societies. And we need to analyze that, right? Because where else are we going to get opportunities to do things like this? It was mentioned in the article about the DIY culture that it was popping up around Cuba, uh, that you could almost see how the environment, the different regions of Cuba produced these DIY innovations based on the geographic and environmental conditions surrounding them. And this is what I think we need to be looking at is how human systems are affected by technological innovations and how the environment around the populace creating these technological in innovations is affected, uh, how the technology that's created is affected by the environment around us. There's a famous saying that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And so we have to look at how our civilization is structured in this nation state setup that we most likely, very likely have a natural affinity towards as human beings. And we need to start looking at how we're going to develop innovations that might allow us to break away from our dependency on this nation state setup that we do, I think, have an affinity towards and have a, and, and gravitate towards. So how are we going to do that? Well, I think several key innovations have to take place. Government, of course, has its tendrils, has control over, and in my opinion, necessarily has control over things like emergency response, things like food and resource allocation, uh, things like taxation, things like a mass communication. The government has some degree of control over all of these facets of society, and these are the most important, in my opinion, facets of society uh, to attack if we were going to dismantle, uh, so to speak, our dependency on on the state you've seen the advent of 3d printable weapons 3d printable guns and munitions and uh, this is an entrepreneur i believe it started with who who uh, learned solid works and learned a bit about tensile strengths and a bit about physics and and dis and started designing his own weapons and and, and the state kind of threw a, a fit right uh, then they, they moved to ban these weapons and frankly i don't really know what's going on with it right now but with the advent of 3d printing of course it allows for the emergence of what you can call, I guess, a backyard engineer. Uh, so long as you know a, a tiny bit about calculus and, and a little bit about SolidWorks and AutoCAD, you can manufacture some pretty in-depth, um, technologically advanced uh, creations, right? And whereas before you needed a, a manufacturing facility, right? That you had to pay uh, to manufacture the prototypical part that you're offering up to them. And they need to, uh, they need to punch that out with a punch press. They need to bend it up with a, a press break. They need to mill it. They need to grind it. They need to lathe it or whatever it is that, you, they, that they need to do. And all of that is very expensive. And of course, the sheet metal that you use, whether it be copper or stainless steel or, 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 or galvanized steel or, or aluminum, it's all very expensive or cold rolled steel. I mean, this is all very expensive to manufacture. It's all, it's all very expensive to buy outright. But now we have the innovation of 3D printing that allows for things like uh, printing out with, with uh, much cheaper materials, non-metallic materials first, so that you can test your prototype, allowing you to work the kinks out, so to speak. And then maybe you only have to pay for one prototype part at a manufacturing facility, right? So that vastly decreases the amount that uh, the, the quote backyard engineer has to invest in bringing his prototypical goods from drafting paper or AutoCAD uh, to reality. And that's a great innovation. And I think that'll serve us very well in the future. And there's no reason why I think people can't start making significantly advanced weaponry to and, and this is a thought experiment. This is merely a thought experiment being carried out to its logical conclusion. I am not advocating violence uh, here, but I, I see no reason why in the future, these backyard engineers could develop some significantly advanced weaponry. And we don't have to match the US government or the Western government's uh, weaponry capabilities. We don't have to match them. 
We just have to make potent enough weaponry ubiquitous, right? We're talking about the most advanced military in the world, the most technologically developed military in the world, the most numerous military in the world, the American military. And look at the problems that they had with invading Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, where everybody has some kind of automatic weapon or AK or a Kalichnikov or something, right? And there's a famous quote, uh, some Japanese military general uh, saying that if, if he ever invaded America, this was, I believe, in World War II, and I'm paraphrasing heavily here, but the, the famous quote goes that if, if, if he was to ever invade America, he would be confronted with a gun behind every blade of grass. The key is, if we're going to do away with the state, the key is to make the methods by which they control us, is to make systems that, that battle and counteract those methods ubiquitous in the in the hands of the everyday citizen it's not just military defense that and and, and make no make and make no mistake about it for the anarcho-capitalists and the libertarians that believe that we're going to do away with the state uh, i'm sorry to have to burst your bubble here but you're going to have to consider armed combat with the united states military right if, if you're not considering armed combat with the, with the united states military and again i'm not advocating violence of any sort against the United States military. I'm simply saying this is what it would take. So for these libertarians that think we're just gonna vote the state out of existence, it's, it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Right, it's the jumbo shrimp of libertarian philosophy. It's not gonna happen. If you wanna get rid of the state, you're going to have to force them to abdicate. But but with that said, it's not just military advancement, right? It's, it's, it's again, it's how are we going to uh, develop systems of res resource disbursement. Uh, how are we going to address uh, the energy needs of a growing uh, anarcho-capitalist civilization or state in its infancy? Uh, how are people going to depend as little as possible on whatever uh, socialized services may be implemented at that point? Because you're not going to go, I mean, let's face it, you're not going to go from depending on a government or a nation state to zero uh, wealth redistribution overnight. It's going to have to be a gradual phasing down. If it's possible or feasible at all, it's going to be gradual. Um, I think one of the most important advents in recent uh, history is the explosion of, of do-it-yourself uh, gardening and aquaponics and things of that nature, where you can produce food in a much lower volume of space using much less uh, resources, much less water. Uh, this is going to be very popular, I think, in, in the future. With all that said, uh, I wanted to introduce you guys to uh, an interesting technology uh, that I think really is going to revolutionize uh, government control over, over food. As many of you know, there's been all sorts of controversy surrounding uh, GMO foods, uh, genetically modified organisms, and, and, and the use of pesticides, and whether or not your food is organic. And of course, um, you never actually really know what you're buying. And I think that this uh, innovation, this uh, invention is going to change all that. And what I'm talking about is a technology called, uh, I believe the name of it is uh, Scion, Scion. I don't, I don't, I never know how you pronounce that word, but um, this is a technology that uses uh,